Welcome to another episode of Dealer Talk, episode three. Super excited today. We have an amazing guest. I just cannot wait to introduce this person. Um, but before I do that, let me check in really quick with my co-host, Mr. Eric Nelson. Eric, what's going on, sir? Oh, man. Great morning, family. And, and Herb, great morning. Uh, excited to receive information. Um, way, you know, I got sweaty palms thinking about this whole process today. So, so bring it. Let's just get into it. All right, man. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, we have a really, really good guest. This person has over 20 years of experience. I guess you could say he has, you know, automotive industry DNA. Um, his family has been involved in anywhere from, from production to being in the dealership, doing the, the work. Um, and so I could not be more excited to introduce Mr. Noel Walsh. Noel, how you doing, sir? I'm doing excellent this morning. How are you doing, Herb and Eric? Wonderful. Awesome, man. We're, we're super excited to have you on the show today and, um, you know, talk about ways that we can bring value to the automotive industry. So before we get going here, can you, uh, just for the listeners out there, can you give us a little bit of a recap of your background and what you're currently up to? Yeah, so my name is Noel Walsh. I'm from NWNA Sales Training. I started selling cars back in 2000. Uh, some really great things I got to experience in my sales career were 9-11, not the best, a great thing, but how it impacted the industry. That was when 0% came around. Mm -hmm. If any of you were in the business, I was there for uh, cash for clunkers. I was there for the tsunami. And these are all things that majorly impacted the business that I got to see how fast a, a major industry could change that sells, you know, 20 million products of an average of $40,000 could change so quick. But I started selling cars in 2000. Uh, my father was anywhere from a salesman to a GM of a, of, of a few stores. My stepfather was a service manager. My grandfather ran Ford Steel. The only person he answered to was Henry Forge. And in 2010, I started my sales training business, NWNA, Noel Walsh and Associates, not the rap group. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I, we moved to St. George where we knew no one or nothing in 2014. And I still sold cars flying back to Michigan the last two weeks of the month until March of 2016. So for nearly two years. But I'm born and bred in the business. I love car sales. I love everything that car sales does. I love car sales people. I love customers. And I love teaching the ways, which is what I do. I'm a sales trainer. Teaching the ways for salespeople to learn how to create energy and enthusiasm through raw effort to make their customers become clients, which become referral and repeat business. Awesome, man. Dude, I love what you just said, right? Customers to clients. That's, uh, that's very powerful. Um, you know, I think that there's, uh, there's something when you about mindset, right? So I, have, for example, there's some, uh, you know, oftentimes when I'm having conversations at dealerships, I see two types of salespeople, right? I see the type of salespeople that refers to their customers as a customer, and then I see people that refer to their customer or that, that client, like you said, as a buyer, right? And I think the mindset when you're in sales is very, very important, right? Because a customer can be somebody that's just there. Maybe they buy, maybe they don't buy. But the buyer is the person that is there to buy. And that's going to make a, a big difference in the attitude of that salesperson. Just like what you said right now, if you think of them as a customer or a client, that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a perception there. Would, would you agree? Oh, definitely. There's a mental impact that comes in. You know, customer is a sale. When you go to Walmart, you're a customer, right? You're buying something, you're handing them your credit card or your cash, you're spending your 86 bucks, you're, you're a customer. There's no relationship there. Right. You need something, you're going to get it. Uh, a client is where you take that customer and you've built that relationship like blocks so strong that they're only going to come. You're that sought out person. They're only going to come to see you and they're going to send everybody they know to see you when they find themselves in the market. Powerful. Very, very powerful. The, the, um, and what are the, from, from your experience and, and what you teach, 
how do you how do you do that mental transformation for the dealerships? What is it you do specifically to, to emphasize that? Yeah, so what I teach, I've got Conquer You online sales training. I do in house training. I do coaching, but Conquer You has over fourteen hundred training modules only, and only fourteen hundred test out questions. But what it's really about is, is like you just said, it's about mentality. It's about relationship based, and it's really about looking at that customer sitting across from your desk, and not looking at them as the potential sale in front of you, but the ten sales that yes. you get in the yes. future from them, yes. and the ten sales everybody they send to you, you'll get in the future from them. Correct. That's wonderful. The um, so since two thousand, and because I want to make sure I get this question out there, because it's I, I think it's a big one. Since two thousand, from your experience. Um, from 2000 till now, what has been the biggest change that you've seen in the auto industry? And and what is how do you see the auto industry changing in the next five years, ten years, future? Blah 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 blah. Yeah. So since 2000, obviously the digital age has taken over most industries. Correct. And so I really saw that come in. I remember when. Customers used to come in and look at vehicles and go shop six other dealerships. And I saw the transformation of where really where they just looked online. Hey, you've got what I'm looking for. You've got a, a decent price. And they go to 1.3 dealerships now. Right. So we have more of a captive audience. So you do have to capture that captive audience. But when people come in, they don't want to play games. And the two biggest complaints I hear about the automotive industry from customers is the time it takes and really what's you know the, the truth of the deal right they, they don't trust dealers because of the games that are played and they don't right. like the time that it takes and so that's really the biggest transformation in the next five or ten years the automotive industry is very uh different i, I train and coach in many different industries but the automotive industry is about the slowest moving industry. But what I do see is no matter what people say, it's all about relationships. And we are selling, and we know this, the second largest people product that people are buying. And so in the next five to 10 years, what I really see is those who really position themselves and really built the right relationships and really approached, handled, and accommodated their customers properly are going to be the people that are going to succeed. And the people that just rely on technology or rely on the old ways are going to be left in the dust. So let me let me ask you this, because this is this is a, a great marketing question I had yesterday. Um, only because the auto industry is filled with old parts like myself. Um, and, and we're used to, you know, we're, we're used to that. You, you talk about the, the truth of the uh, of the deal, meaning that I'm, I'm assuming that I, what you mean by that is that, you know, the, the, the price that's posted online does not match up with the first pencil um, coming out to the customer when they when they come into the dealership. Um, what? How do, how do we change our mindset? What is it? How, how do we take advantage of? Um, I mean, golly, how do we embrace that? To just trust in um, that the customer will come back, that we don't have to, you know, we don't have to take their head off each time. Yeah, so it's it's not about trusting that the customer will come back. It's about building the proper processes and following them. And the right things always come back, right? So we all know this in life. The right things always come back to you. So if you take care of people in a way they want to be taken care of, really what I said when I, I sold customers is thank you for giving me the opportunity to accommodate you and your family. Because that's really what we're doing is we're accommodating them, right? We're not selling them. We're accommodating them. Mm -hmm. Especially nowadays, people come in, we really don't have to sell them. They sold themselves. They came in as a buyer. We just have to take care of that transaction. Now, if you gentlemen are like me, when I find a professional, I don't want to go elsewhere, right? They, they do a good job. Their price is fair. And they take care of what I need when I need to go and see a doctor. 
And so you want to be that sought out go to person. And when you address the customer's needs, you address their wants, you put them through a simple to them process and accommodate that transaction in a way that's fair, fun, and fascinating, they will come back or send you family and friends because you gave them an experience. And if we're just there and we've got a car, like you just said, it's $17,995 and first pencil is $21,000. What is it that people buy from? People they know, like, trust, and I say ultimately respect, right? So when you come in three or $4,000 higher than your advertised price, the, the window hanger in the car, you lose all those four things. And so what we want to do is it's not looking for one because, you know, you can have a, a really good commission and not sell anything for two weeks. Right. And I was in the business that I wanted to sell somebody every day. And my dad taught me early in my career, gross comes with numbers, right? You'll have your big gross, you'll have your small gross, but it's really about that person in front of you making it fun, fair, and fascinating experience. And what they'll do is they'll be accustomed to the feeling that they get, and they'll want to come back to you and tell everybody they know about you. Yeah, that's... Uh... I totally, totally agree with that. So um, I want to kind of circle back here for a second, Noel. You said something right now that kind of caught my 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 ear, and it was you talked about you know the the time aspect, right, and how how that's changed. And my mind immediately went to uh, you know this thought of you know where the automotive industry is today, right? We're in an efficient market, right? So what that means is that the buyers and sellers have access to the same information. So it's not like, you know, 10, 20 years ago when the when the dealers pretty much held all the cards. Right now, it's all about transparency and, you know, there's less um, dealer visits. Right. So if somebody um, shows up at your store, they're pretty much there to buy. Right. They've already made that decision for the most Correct. part. So um, my question is, you know, how how is that sales process changed and, and more importantly, you know, what can, you know, what kind of advice, right, can we give to the people that are, you know, taking ops and, and actually doing this uh, day in and day out um, to, so that you, they can kind of, um, you know, put that, take that, exp uh, not experience, but take that concept of efficiency and buyers and sellers having the same information to kind of reduce that friction, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, you said it, you said it very well. And, you know, I think the salesperson now, how the business has changed, like you just said, I stated earlier, they're coming in to buy now. So I started selling cars in 2000. What people would do is they would look in the Sunday newspaper, right? This is like almost before online presence, right? They'd look in the Sunday newspaper, they'd see who had the deals. They would come in and they'd go see five, six dealerships have their trade appraised at the dealerships, um, look at the, the cars, look at the prices, all this type of stuff. And it wasn't always the best salesperson who won because we all know that sometimes they get to the fifth dealership and they just get wore out, right? And even though they like number two the most, they're just wore out, they, they're, they're done with the process. Well, now what you have is when people step on your dealership, when they step foot, on your place of business, they are there to buy. And you have to understand this. And now more than ever, people ha are busier than ever. And their schedules are filled. So you have to respect other people's time. And if you want to be respected, you have to respect other people. And so I think now more than ever, you have to act to the customer. That doesn't mean they lead the process. Because if you go to McDonald's or you go to a restaurant, the kid taking your order or the, the waiter or waitress or hostess or host who's sitting you down is leading the process. So we need to lead the process in a way that the customer feels that they're in charge and they have the leverage, right? But ultimately in sales, we have the leverage because they came to see our product, right? They didn't just come because we have a nice building. 
They didn't just come because we spent $100,000 in marketing a month. They came because we have the product that they searched, learned about, and came to sought, they came to sought after it. And so we just really have to address what that customer wants and what that customer needs in a timely manner. The old days of four hour deliveries and all the TOs is that's what's going away. You asked that earlier, next five or 10 years, yes. customers are just not going to accept that in the same way. They just aren't going to. And, you know, honestly, when you address, like I said, t turning a customer into a client, when you address the sales process like a professional and you make it, like I said, now my third time, fun, fair, and fascinating, people will come back sooner because they remember the feeling you gave them. Now, on the flip side, if you make it painstaking, stressful, and really, you know, non-transparent, they'll come back less because of that uncomfortable process you put them through. Life is about processes. When it's easy, we embrace it. When it's complicated, we put it off and we hide from it. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And, and I think that we found in the auto industry is that as long as we're, you know, addressing the customers as far as a, a realistic timeline, they're comfortable with that process. But it's great to have the initial idea up front of what they expect, too. So I think there's advantage of that. You know, would you would you think it's fair to say that um, today's friction um, that lies with most customers? I mean, even if we are um, as long as we're respectful to the whatever price we posted online, and we're penciling with that number. I mean, I know that I, I find with us personally is that there, there's friction in trade evaluations. What is your what's your thought process on on trade evaluations? Because the consumer's idea of a trade evaluation versus what the dealership's idea of the, the trade evaluation. How do you how do you overcome with that? No, great statement. Um, you know, not enough people talk about this, but it's one of the, like, I used to grieve it when I was a sales more than anything. And so, you know, here's, here's a customer, you know, they want KBB excellent retail, right? For the trading. And then as a dealership, we're like a thousand below KBB rough trading, correct? Correct. So we're starting out like $5,000 away. So what we need to do is we need to compare our price to the market standard and compare their trade to, you know, fair trade and value. And then without going overboard, we need to explain how a business works and how we buy stuff at wholesale, right? So, Walmart doesn't drive by and see the little farmer stand and say, oh, well, we're going to go buy a bunch of apples at retail. No, they have vendors who they buy from at wholesale. That's how businesses work. Right. And so it's not about pushing that down their throat, but it's about exposing that and bringing it up. Hey, we're a place of business. We have reconditioning fees. We have marketing costs. <laughs> We have this. We have to put our money out there, right? We have to buy your trade for $12,000 and put $12,000 out there. And just breaking that down and then showing them really how it works and then comparing, hey, look, you're getting 85% of what you thought, but you're only paying 87% of the you know, MSRP of this vehicle. So we have to lay it out because that's the way it works. Car sales is like any other industry that, you know, when you go to buy a house, the realtor isn't sitting there trying to get you more for your house than their manager, right? It is what it is. You get what you get. Somebody offers it. So what we have to do is we have to expel that information and really try and impede the customer's mind that, hey, you can go do all the stuff that we do and sell it on your own. Or you can just get it taken care of right now at this price. 
Yeah, I, I like that that comparison that you just made there with, uh, you know, with uh, real estate, right? I mean, when you think about it, that's that's right on. I mean, there, none of that process exists, and for the most part, buyers are accepting of that, right? So right. Um, it's it's kind of odd how in the automotive industry, um, that's that's just completely not the case. Um, and it, yeah, and I, real quick too, I think the biggest problem with salespeople and trade ins is is when a customer wants $21,000 for their vehicle that's worth 18000 now all of a sudden we're fighting for that and we're trying to get there before we make the customer justify how they got to that figure, right? We're always justifying how we got to our figures. Well, they're selling that trade in to us. It's time for them to justify how they got to their figure because when you make people justify, they'll really stop and think about it and they'll think more rational. Because obviously, if they're like, "Hey, I want you, you gave me eighteen thousand for my trade. I want twenty one thousand," and we're like, "Okay, if, if I get you twenty one thousand, will you buy late?" They're like, "Oh yeah." Well, now we're justifying that number, right? Yeah, no. We're fighting as there's something that, that doesn't exist. We need to make them justify. How did you get here? Can I ask you that? How did you get to this figure? What makes this figure fair in your head? Tell me, because I want to get you whatever you want, but I just need to know. Yeah, I like that. That's 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 good stuff, man. So kind of, um, you know, this is a perfect segue uh, to a question that I, uh, I was um, kind of, you know, prepped it when I knew that you were going to uh, be with us today, uh, taking all your obviously your experience in the industry and what you're doing right now with, um, you know, doing the, the coaching, if you will. Um, you know, can you talk about um, objections handling process, right? And the reason why, because, you know, for the listeners that are actually taking ups and, and, and selling every single day, obviously, this is always a topic that, uh, that there's value there, right? There, could, there may be different techniques or things like that, that maybe you could share or just your thought process on it and how to handle those. Perfect question, perfect segue, because I'm actually working on a course right now, 50 objections and 100 rebuttals for my online. And so, you know, anytime we get an objection, what I always teach is empathize and agree. Okay. And not in the sense that, hey, I only take 25,000. You're right. That's worth 25,000. No. But when somebody says, hey, we found a better price than your competitor. Excellent. I always like to look for the best price too. Where did you see this price? Right? Make them explain it. Because if we're showing them a fully loaded XYZ and they saw the online ad or newspaper or TV or whatever it was for the base model, but they look the same on TV, right? Or in the ad or online. And we're 7,000 higher, all of a sudden we, we're, we're going to our manager saying, hey, we need to be 7,000 lower. They found a lower price. <laughs> well, they're, they're looking at the base XYZ. See, we didn't investigate and identify. So I think more than ever, what salespeople need to do is investigate, identify. Well, Actually, come up, agree. And now you put the customer on the driver's seat. You put the customer to explain how they got there. Right. It's all about transparency. Let's see. A transparent relationship only works when both parties are transparent. And so often salespeople don't ask the right questions. They don't go through the right process. They aren't listening to understand. And they never hold customers accountable. And so hold them accountable and have them explain why. Hey, you know, we got more. I got a lower price down the street. Excellent. I always like getting the best deal when I go out shopping for a product too. I can see you're an intelligent person. Can I ask you this? Where did you see that price? Excellent. Who have you talked to about that price? Excellent. Is this the out the door number? Or is this just something online plus, 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 plus? Make the customer explain to you because it brings them closer to reality. See what salespeople do so often is they address all the customer's objections in a way that's showing the customer, you're right, let me get to that figure, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then they're going there to their manager. Hey, I, I've got a buyer here. Come on, let's make this happen. And it's we're seven thousand dollars apart because you let them run. And so what we need to do is we need to approach things early. But old school car business of putting the cor- the customer in a corner, it might get you some sales. It'll get you a few. But guess what? They won't come back to see you, and they won't tell their friends about you. And success is any kind of business or sales is built on all repeat and residual business. We make 70% more on repeat and referral business than we do on marketed business, right? Internet customers, lot customers, phone customers. We make 70% more because those people are only calling simply on a price or a product. To where a repeat and referral customer is coming back because of the experience that they received. Yeah, dude, I love that. That's so good. I totally, totally agree with that. That's awesome. So um, I wanted to touch, uh, it's kind of, I don't want to say a different topic, but this is one of your talents as well. And I wanted to see how you can relate that uh, for um, people who are selling, right? Because I think that there's, that there's something here with social media platforms like, like LinkedIn, for example. And I know that, you know, for the people that are going to connect with you through through this uh, this effort. They're they're going to uh, see what an amazing social media presence you have, and so taking that experience and then tying that into into sales, right? What um, what advice could you could you give to people that are in the car business, salespeople in particular, on the power of, of platforms like LinkedIn and how they can use that to actually generate business? Because a lot of times when I have these conversations. Um, they 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 really don't think that th- these platforms can help them. No, it's 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 funny. Um, <clears throat> some people think that uh, social media is their saving grace, right? It's going to be everything. And some people think that social media is just something that teenage girls do. And social media is as real as rain. And so my biggest things I would say is be real, be transparent, and be consistent. And just like anything, you most likely won't see results in 90 days, right? Just about anything takes 90 days. You're building up your podcast. It takes time. And so to build that audience, to build that following and all this. So I think what uh, salespeople need to do is they need to have a presence. They need to pick their platforms and they need to be real, transparent, and consistent. And also engagement. It's just like your customers. What, what do we all teach? What do we all know as salespeople? The number one thing is two words starts with an F, second word's you. Follow up, right? And so that's what social media gives us is the instant opportunity to follow up, right? To engage, to embrace, and to take on. And so social media takes time, but it is the most effective way of marketing in today's age. And 99% of it's free. And so you just have to embrace that and make that part of your process. You know, I see, and you guys have seen working in dealerships and working in businesses, that the average salesperson wastes 80% of their day. Mm. Right? They're, They're sitting around talking about how their manager didn't do this, how the marketing's not doing this, how nobody's coming in, just really muddying the waters. And what they really need to do is come in and just do the busy work and look at the opportunities and plan for the future. You know, in in sales, we start out as hunters, but we want to evolve to farmers because a hunter every day has to go out and get their meat. But a farmer knows every fall they're going to have a ton of food that will feed men. So you have to apply yourself as a farmer, work, grow, and tend to, and you will, you know, you, you'll be blessed by plenty. Awesome. So there it is, guys, directly from, um, you know, just an amazing um, – um, salesperson, sales trainer, 
Um, like I said earlier, just super excited to have you on. I loved all the things that you talked about today. I think you you um, touched on some really, really uh, key points and, and gave some really good advice. So hopefully for the listeners out there, um, you know, definitely make sure that you connect with Mr. Noel Walsh. Uh, we'll put your contact information in the in the show notes. And I want to give you a, a quick second to um, kind of let people know how they can get in touch with you. But before I do that, I always have a, a question that I like to ask everybody that comes on. Eric already asked the direct question, so I'll kind of change it up for this episode. Uh, but where do you see um, sales, right? The sales process in the automotive industry in the next five years and why? I, so I see in the next five years is going to come become even more relationship based. And it's going to be uh, based on the process of the transaction. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this stat, but we take on eight times more data than we did five years ago, the average human being. Okay, eight times more data than we did five years ago. Wow. So people's minds are clouded. They have a lot going on. And we're at the point now where we want a go-to person, right? This is broke. Fix it for me. So really, you have to be like that service person for your customers that when they have an issue or a problem, you address it and you find a solution. You can't always give them the perfect solution. That's ridiculous to think that you always can. But you have to offer a solution. If they accept it or not, you did your best. But I think in the next five years, it's you, you've got to engage with them on different platforms. You've got to be that sought-after go-to person that they know when they have an issue or a problem or something that makes them uncomfortable, that they can go to you, and you will offer some sort of viable solution and it's it's all about follow-up but i think in the later days in five years people are going to be even more relationship buyers because that no like trust and respect are already built in there right on man hey thank you so much for coming on I really really appreciated your insights i'm sure our listeners will will do also um, why don't you um, take a couple of minutes here and just let them know how they can get in touch with you, where they can reach you. Um, and then again, I'm going to put it in the notes. So, uh, you know, if you don't catch it here on the audio, make sure to check out the notes for that um, contact info. Absolutely. So my name is Noel Walsh. I'm from NWNA Sales Training. I'm right here in St. George, Utah, an hour and a half from Las Vegas. And my phone number is 734-678-4502. My email is my name, N-O-E-L, at N-W-N-A, salestraining.com. I do offer free consultations and strategy sessions. I do in-house training. I do sales coaching. And I do have my Conquer You online sales training platform with over 1,400 sales training modules to help salespeople go to where they want to grow. Right on. Eric, any final thoughts? Look, man, my, my wrist hurts. I'm writing stuff down like a, like a madman. <laughs> this has just been what, what I like to refer to as I just like to shut up and, and, and listen to knowledge. You know what I mean? I've been fed, so I'm, I'm quite full. Right on, right on. All right, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening in. And as always, we'll talk later. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.